So our next speaker is going to be Professor Sid Bedingfield. Uh, so uh, Sid is the author of Newspaper Wars, Civil Rights, and White Resistance in South Carolina. Uh, he is also the co-editor of a new book, Journalism and Jim Crow, White Supremacy and the Black Struggle for a New America. Uh, he is a professor of journalism at the Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Minnesota. Uh, but he did his PhD work here at Columbia, so he's very familiar with the area and the history, and he's going to be talking to us about uh, John McRae, the black press, and the struggle for American democracy. So please welcome me in joining Join me in welcoming Mr. Sid Bedingfield to the stage. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm thrilled to be here. And I have to start uh, by thanking Allen University and uh, Dr. Kevin Trumpeter, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Janie Bradford uh, Kennard as well, um, for, uh, for their work in setting up uh, this um, uh, South Carolina Black Press Institute. Uh, it is uh, uh, much needed uh, and frankly uh, long overdue as well. Now, you know, we all have, uh, I suppose, uh, regrets. You know, and I think maybe my greatest professional regret, among several, but my greatest one, is not a dozen years ago, or about 10 years ago, not interviewing Cecil Williams uh, for the book I wrote about uh, civil rights in South Carolina. Didn't have the knowledge, didn't quite know that that's somebody I really need to talk to, because that was a fabulous presentation. and. Um, I agreed with just about everything he said about um, the importance of looking uh, beyond uh, those, uh, what are sometimes called the master narrative of the civil rights, those years from 1954 to 1965, and looking at events that led up to it. Uh, and that's why I think John McRae is so important, uh, and others in South Carolina are uh, so important. <clears throat> so you know, it, is 70, it was 70 years ago, in 1952, that John McRae was arrested and forced to serve two months on a state chain gang, a notorious state chain gang. Uh, a decade before that, uh, McRae's newspaper, The Lighthouse and Informer, in its early years, um, had exposed just how brutal uh, black men were treated on the state's road gangs at the time. And now, at that time, he was having to serve on one. McRae had been charged with criminal libel. Why? Well, as one of the students mentioned earlier in the presentation, simply for publishing an interview with a black defendant who had denied the charges that he had committed sexual assault. McRae didn't necessarily say that the, that the uh, charges weren't true. He just the man denied it, and McRae reported that he had uh, denied it. On the advice, probably good advice, from his NAACP lawyers, uh, McRae decided to plead guilty to this charge. Rather than face an all-white jury in Newberry County, 1952, when he was actually being tried. 1950 was when he was being tried, actually. Uh, uh, <coughs> Um, he was placed on probation, but then, like nine months after he began his probation, um, he was accused of violating that probation by traveling to speaking at engagements out of state, leaving the state without notifying his probation officers. Now, McRae had developed a national reputation in the early 1950s, and his arrest had drawn national attention. And so he was invited to speak at some prominent places around the country, the New York Press Club, for example, in North Carolina at a fairly significant event, and elsewhere. And these were publicized events that he had made no effort to hide. In fact, he'd gone the other way. He'd publicized these events that he would be speaking at. Um, but yet, he was then accused of leaving the state without letting his uh, 
parole officer know about it. All of this occurred at a time when black citizens in Clarendon County were challenging segregation in the schools in South Carolina. And that case was making its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And Governor James F. Burns wanted to persuade black South Carolinians to drop that lawsuit, as Cecil Williams just mentioned. He raised tax, a 3% tax increase to put money into black schools to try to persuade black South Carolinians to turn against the NAACP and say separate but equal is going to be better uh, and therefore let's stick with that and not actually challenge segregation in uh, the high court. McRae in his newspaper repeatedly claimed that Burns was trying to trick the black community and tried also trying to fool northerners into thinking that uh, that things were different than they really were in South Carolina. And he said this, McRae said this repeatedly in the newspaper. Now, was Burns, a powerful man, so frustrated by McRae's editorials, urging, supporting the Clarendon County, um, uh, those in Clarendon County, the parents who were uh, challenging segregation and pursuing it in the courts? Was he so angry that he actually urged uh, prosecution officials to um, charge McRae with a parole violation. I looked and looked. McRae certainly thought that was true. I, you couldn't find any hard evidence that Burns had done that. But it is clear that he wanted to shut down an important voice in South Carolina at the time. Now, if you have read much of McRae's writing, and as a um, student said earlier, his, uh, his, his use of sarcasm uh, uh, in his writing as well, you know that he had a wicked sense of humor, and he had a real taste for irony. So I can only imagine how he would respond to the good news that we are celebrating today and this year. He would be very honored, I believe, to be inducted into the Press Association's Hall of Fame in South Carolina. McRae, if you've read his papers and read his articles, he was a man of no small ego. Probably had to be to take on the role that he did. And he would like to see his work receive its due, but he could also be biting and sarcastic. So I'm sure he would probably say something like, about time as well, <laughs> about that honor. Um, that press association honor, um, I think it is well deserved long overdue, but definitely well-deserved, because in my view, John McRae and his newspaper, working hand-in-hand -hand with other civil rights leaders, as Cecil Williams pointed out, played an important role in the history of the state and in the nation as well. The movement that they launched in the 40s, and even in the early 40s, uh, had a string of successes across that decade. First, NAACP membership grew dramatically during that time. The organization also spearheaded a successful fight to overturn the system of unequal pay for black teachers, which the students also very ably discussed earlier. The rising movement broke down the doors to the Democratic Party's all-white primaries for a whole host of reasons. It's McCrave really believed that the Democratic Party was the forum, was the vehicle for black political aspirations uh, going forward at that time. And after they were able to vote in Democratic primaries, 1948, they, uh, the, the um, movement also rallied black voters to defeat uh, the racist Strom Thurmond in a Senate primary in 1950 played a critical role in defeating Thurman after he had run as a Dixiecrat for president. The South Carolina movement also filed the school desegregation suit that would eventually lead to Brown v. Board of Education, that landmark case ending uh, criminalizing, outlawing segregation in schools. These were remarkable achievements at the time. And here's the most important point. They laid the groundwork for the larger mass movement that would emerge across the South and eventually topple Jim Crow in the 50s and really in the 1960s. 
And this is to Cecil Williams' point. That work in the 40s in South Carolina and then in the 50s, early 50s as well, was essential to the larger movement that emerged um, and came to fruition really after the Montgomery boy bus boycott uh, and with the sit-ins in the 60s and then of course with the effort uh, that led to the U.S. Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and the Open Housing Act of 19, uh, 1968. Um, it's also worth noting, I mean, some people would call uh, the, the, those activists in South Carolina, McCray and his newspaper, the vanguard of the emerging civil rights movement. And I think that's an accurate description uh, as well. It's also worth noting, though, just where this movement began and how it began and the unlikeliness of its origins, really. In 1935, depths of the Depression, when John McRae returned home to South Carolina from college in Alabama, there was precious little political activism in the state's black community. The white leaders of the state believed the, um, <coughs> the battle was over. They did. They believed they had won, that white supremacy was now the rule in the South and it would never really be challenged again. And that even the black community no longer believed that they could really attack the status quo of the Jim Crow system. So in that environment, how did a movement grow so quickly from such desolate political terrain? It's an important question. And to try to answer it, I'd like to take just a few minutes to provide a little background on McCray to begin with, but also on his relationship with two other important players in this drama, Majeska Simpkins, who is well known, and Osceola uh, McCain, who is not as well known. McCray was born in 1910, long after the demise of Reconstruction, but in many ways, and you know, I'm, I'm making this claim. I don't know if others have made this argument, but I'm going to make. I've been making this argument, and I think I'm right here. Um, McRae was a product of that brief moment after the Civil War, when black citizens and black rights flourished in the South during the Reconstruction years. He grew up in Lincolnville, an all-black community near Charleston, founded during Reconstruction by Reverend Richard Kane of the AME Church. During McRae's childhood in Lincolnville, this enclave that existed because of Reconstruction, he routinely saw uh, blacks in positions of authority. And later in life, he said this experience instilled in him a sense of racial pride that led to his political activism. As he entered high school, McRae attended Charleston's Avery Normal Institute, another product of the Reconst Reconstruction era, that brief 12-year period. Founded uh, by New York uh, Abolitionist Society, Avery was designed in the 1870s to create a black leadership class in the post-war South, presumably this pluralistic uh, post-war South in which uh, whites and blacks could vote and were supposed to be living as equal citizens in society. Well, McCray benefited uh, from his studies at Avery, particularly under black instructors like Andrew Simmons and others. Pearlie Simmons, as he was called, was a fierce advocate for equal rights, who publicly denounced segregated seating in the Battery, on streetcars, and in Colonial Lake Park in Charleston when McRae was in high school. McRae graduated as a valedictorian and won a scholarship to Talladega College in Alabama, had offers of scholarships to other schools in the North, but chose to ended up going to Talladega. He earned a degree in chemistry, as the students reported uh, earlier, but at Talladega, he developed a passion for advocacy journalism and can never quite shake uh, its hold on him. Uh, he would always say, newspaper, quote, newspapering gets in your blood. Uh, McRae launched the Charleston Lighthouse. He did some other journalistic work between 1935 and 1939, but in 1939 he launched uh, the Charleston Lighthouse. 
and he immediately drew statewide attention by covering events right here at Allen University. Sort of his breakout story in some ways. Remember, this was 1939, 1940, not the Allen of today. But then students were fed up with the conservative leadership at the school and the AME, on the AME board of directors at the time. The conflict grew, grew so heated that Allen's students marched out of classes and went on strike. McCray, in his newspaper, took the side of the students. And his newspaper came down hard against the Allen president. Uh, McCray, in his inimitable style, which he would hone over the years, proclaimed in one editorial during the controversy, hell is going to be so full of AME preachers and presiding elders, the rest of us need not worry about where we're going to go when we die. His coverage of the dispute caught the attention of Simpkins and of Osceola McCain, but primarily Majeska Simpkins. McCain um, is worth a little bit of background on McCain because he had uh, met Simpkins by this time and they would be essential in bringing McCray into the NAACP. McCain was born in Sumter, but he was a wandering son of South Carolina. He had studied at Boston College, then joined the Army, and in 1916 he had fought with the 24th Infantry in Mexico. McCain did well in the Army. He was a smart guy, a very capable guy, and he was identified for officer training. But the experience in the Army also radicalized him, especially fighting in World War I. The white officers who trained him were white supremacists who were dedicated to maintaining segregation in the South and in the Army. McCain did fight in Europe during World War I, and he later ran a successful nightclub in Belgium. He probably would have stayed there the rest of his life, but Hitler and the Nazis intervened. In 1940, McCain fled Belgium ahead of the invading German army, and he returned to his birthplace in Sumter. And he was deeply disappointed with what he found. The Jim Crow system uh, of white supremacist rule seemed more powerful than ever than when he left 20 years earlier. And he believed the black community should do more to fight it. He understood how hard that was. I don't want to imply that he thought, well, they really are just accepting this. No, he knew the pressure they were under. But he thought, nonetheless, they had to have, be encouraged to, as a community, fight the status quo. Uh, McCain met Majeska Simpkins here in Columbia. It was in the fight over equal pay for teachers. The two of them met. They were about the same age, and they realized that they were kindred spirits. Both were college educated, well-read, quick-witted, and neither suffered fools easily. They were determined to launch a war on white supremacist rule but also a war on what they saw as the black community's overly cautious response at that time. To win that war, McCain and Simpkins believed the NAACP needed to develop a distinct voice, one that could bring the community together and rally support among the state's black citizens. Now, in 1940, Simpkins was already a veteran NAACP activist. As a teenager during World War I, she had attended NAACP meetings in Columbia with her mother. Not long after black attorney Butler Nance, a name we should all know as well, uh, after Butler Nance had formed the chapter, Nance worked closely with a newspaper, The Southern Indicator, edited by J.A. Roach, to rally support for the new NAACP brand, NAACP branch in 1915, 1916. By 1940, Simpkins and McCain were looking for a newspaper to play the same role for this new uh, assault on voting rights in uh, South Carolina that they wanted to launch. Simpkins had seen McCray take on the conservative leaders of the AME Church during the controversy here at Allen, and she was impressed. She thought McCray might be the right editor for the job. 
Simpkins and McCain uh, um, asked McRae, and uh, the, earlier uh, it was talking about the Sumter newspaper, but E.A. Parker, the Sumter informer, was about to go out of business. It was a good paper, but it was sort of running aground. Uh, and so McCain got E.A. Parker involved, and they all went to McRae and said, look, why don't you merge your paper with the informer, Lighthouse and Informer, and move it to Columbia, where Majeska Simpkins' husband has some property that you can use as an office, uh, and we can help get this paper going, and you can work closely with the NAACP, right? And it's fair to say, uh, McKay read, uh, McRae readily agreed, and by 1941, the Lighthouse and Informer was operating right down here, Washington Street, Hardin and Washington, and um, at, at first on, on uh, Washington Street. Um, and I think it's fair to say, I think it is fair to say, it is not hyperbole to say that the state of South Carolina was never the same again. So, it's 1941, the Lighthouse and Informer is being published here in Columbia. What was McRae's newspaper like? Well, I mentioned the expose on brutality of chain gangs, which occurred early in the run of the paper. It was a powerful piece of investigative journalism, and it surprised black readers and white readers, too. They were not used to seeing that kind of aggressive reporting in a black newspaper. But in that case, the governor conceded that McRae's reporting was mostly factual, or appeared to be factual, and he even promised a state investigation. Now, nothing really came of that investigation, but that was a step forward when an investigative piece in a new black newspaper could prompt the governor of the state to at least say he was going to investigate this problem with the treatment of uh, blacks on road gangs in the state. McRae's editorials in the newspapers in the early days, obviously this was the whole point of the operation, focused heavily on political and social issues, and he frequently urged readers to join the NAACP and support the campaign for voting rights. As he put it uh, in one of his earlier uh, editorials, quote, they should rebel and fight for their rights as American citizens to reject the slavery of thought and action that created Uncle Tom's and Aunt Jemima's and, became, and become progressive fighters for the emancipation of the race. Those were strong words in 1943 in South Carolina, right? Um, and many whites, some whites, took notice and said, wait a minute, this is not the kind of rhetoric we've been hearing from the black community across the, across the 30s. Um, Okay, so yes, it certainly made the argument that you would expect in editorials uh, across the 40s and into the 50s. But I, I also argue the newspaper was important in another way that doesn't get much attention, one that was much uh, less directly political. It helped build community across the towns and villages where black people lived in South Carolina. Most of the black community was still rural at that time. The paper's so-called society columns served as a type of social media, I argue, for black communities across the state. Each week, the correspondents from big cities, small towns, and rural crossroads sent in items about the comings and goings of local folk. Let me just read from a couple of editions, just a few examples. Like in early 1943, the newspaper Shiraw correspondent noted, Miss Virginia Talley of New York City was in town visiting her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Martin Talley. While the Aiken Stringer reported that Mrs. Essie Mason is visiting relatives in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, and Mrs. Janie Boosie has returned to Philadelphia after being called to Aiken by the death of her father, Mr. James G. Boosie. In tiny Graniteville, a play, Aunt Sabini's Christmas, was successfully presented at the Valley Fair Baptist Church on Christmas Day. And in Charleston, Mrs. Annie Elisa Hammond announced the marriage of her daughter, Doretha Bonnois, to Mr. James Charles Ellis of, Greens of Greensboro, North Carolina. And on and on it went, every edition of the newspaper, each week. The names and hometowns of dozens of black South Carolinians peppered the pages of the Lighthouse and Informer. 
Now, these items might not seem like much on the face of it, but they made the, uh, the newspaper a must-read in the black community across the state. They helped knit that community together, I would argue, uh, they sh and show people they were not alone, but part of something larger than themselves, part of a larger community suffering through the same struggles, who understood each other, maybe. Also, note from those few items I read how these brief society notes provided an informal geography of the Great Migration and how they documented the ongoing interaction uh, between communities, uh, black communities in the North and South. Thousands of black South Carolinians had moved North in search of jobs and to escape Jim Crow over the last two decades leading up to this time. Yet many, most, retained extraordinarily close ties with their original communities. So they were also, think about what they were bringing in in terms of the northern black press and the northern public sphere and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois' work in the crisis and the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier. They're bringing that into communities in the south and McRae is also quoting that in his newspaper and they're all you know, reading and passing around the Lighthouse and Informer, and they're all getting a sense that they're part of this larger community that is set to take action on its own behalf in South Carolina. So, I would say by chronicling um, these interactions so closely, the Lighthouse and Informer created a personal bond with its readers and cemented um, ties with the churches, schools, and local organizations that formed the core of black civic life in South Carolina in the 1940s. Perhaps more <clears throat> than any editorial comment, <clears throat> excuse me, it was this commitment <clears throat> to small town local journalism that paved the way for the Lighthouse and Informer to organize and mobilize black Carolinians for the political fight ahead. And of course, that was the newspaper's primary objective, to encourage black South, Car South Carolinians to join the fight. Uh, McRae's newspaper raged against the injustice of Jim Crow rule in the South, that's for sure. But the paper also aimed, and McRae aimed, some of his sarcasm and some of his harshest criticism at black South Carolinians who he believed refused to join the civil rights organization, the NAACP, and fight back. McRae often delivered these di uh, diatribes in his distinctly uh, sarcastic style. And, uh, the student who made the comparison to Wale CNK, I think, is exactly on the money. That is a paper that is waiting to be published once he gets that done, I believe, because uh, that's such a good idea. I wish I'd thought of it, but I didn't. In one column, just to give you a little example, the editor lashed out at what he described as the I kill it. These were members of the black community who McRae believed were working with white supremacists to try to kill the civil rights struggle. McRae said the I killets are, quote, low down skunks. They are vultures who undermine black civil rights efforts in return for a few scraps from the white man's table. McRae compared the I killets to another group within the black community that he thought existed, the people he called the I done it's. He said, these people mean well, but they are, quote, just weakling fatalists who tremble at the mere suggestion of battling for their rights. Quote, they run into a hole and hide when the battle rages, but as soon as the victory parade forms, they dash out in front, like the devil, to take over the whole business and acclaim the credit. Now, you know, that is a little harsh, because there were reasons for black South Carolinians at the time to be worried about, one, would political engagement succeed or would it merely lead to violence or economic retribution with no gain? They'd certainly seen a lot of that over the last three decades. Um, and two, did McRae and the NAACP have it together? Were they, was this the right moment to push forward and risk all? So I can express a little sympathy for those uh, that McRae was, uh, was blasting in his newspaper. But McRae, with Simpkins and McCain, felt like 
Yes, they, I, I'm sure they did feel some sympathy. They understood the pressure they were under, but they felt there's no other way to launch this movement than to try to provoke them into joining it, to shame them into joining it. And so that's the tactic that they chose. It's the way I, I see it, based on his writings and also on uh, Majeska uh, Simpkins' writing as well, her letters and things like that. Now, of course, McCrae... Simpkins and McCain knew the fight would grow difficult. They didn't act like it was going to be easy. All we have to do is launch this fight and it'll work. And of course, that fight did become difficult. After the success of the 40s that I mentioned, when frankly, I think you could argue, especially the early 40s, the white leadership community was um, sort of indifferent to this emerging civil rights movement. They did not think it really posed a threat which gave the, them, uh, the movement, a little more space to operate uh, and a little more space where they could move forward without being, uh, 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 you know, without a backlash hitting them quite so hard. Uh, but of course, when Judge Waddy's Waring uh, began to uh, deliver his opinions in support of equal pay for black teachers, and then even more dramatically in support for um, ending the all-white Democratic Party, Democratic primaries in the party. And then when Truman finally, in 1948, pushed a civil rights legislation, the first president to push a civil rights legislation since Reconstruction, that's when the white community began to turn on the civil rights, that emerging civil rights movement in South Carolina and make things a whole lot, a whole lot harder, right? Um, so after the success of the 40s, and also especially after the 1954 Brown decision, the movement faced a fierce white crack, uh, crackdown. And in 1954, McRae's newspaper, The Lighthouse and Informer, went out of business. It had always teetered on the brink of financial collapse, but in 1948, a, uh, a, group, a, a group of... Uh, civic leaders in the community, including the president of Allen at the time, got together and formed a corporation and put the paper on much stronger financial footing. Uh, it had been very successful. The movement was very successful. It had joined uh, a national reputation. The Progressive Dem Democratic Party that McRae founded to try to, it was an insurgency inside the Democratic Party. It was meant to break into the Democratic Party. It wasn't really a third party. It was an effort to bust into the Democratic Party. And it succeeded eventually. Uh, but all of that had happened, and there was an effort to put the paper on really firm financial footing. And they did for a while, but by 1954, it was uh, struggling. But, and when it finally collapsed, went into bankruptcy, it was shuttered, and the press, the paper's press, was sold for $638 uh, in back taxes. Now, the paper's struggle in the early 50s was really exa exacerbated by this growing split between McRae and Simpkins. Their good relationships of the early 40s turned into a feud by the early 50s. And their riff was partly a personality clash. Both were strong-willed as heck, even arrogant, right? And both were quick to suspect the worst in others sometimes. I think that's fair to say. McRae claimed Simpkins had not done enough to help his family when he was serving time on the chain gang. Simpkins heatedly disputes that, always has, up until the end of her life. Yet, beside that personal interaction, which was bad enough, there were substantive political differences as well. And I think this is important to point out. Black community is not a monolith. It never has been, never will be. It's not right now, it wasn't then. There were differences in strategy and tactics and how to move forward. Um, Simpkins at the time, especially in the late 40s, right after the war and up to 1950, wanted um, the black movement in South Carolina to form alliances with national organizations on the left, the so-called popular front that emerged after the New Deal and into the war years. Some of these organizations had very direct ties with the Communist Party open ties with the Communist Party. McRae opposed that. He supported local control of the movement in South Carolina and really was, really was wary of the Communist Party, claimed communists 
the American Communist Party had sent officials down here to try to infiltrate the paper and take it over. Not sure that's true, but he was very wary of it. And of course, um, by the 1950s, as the Red Scare intensifies, China falls to communism, the Soviets uh, test a nuclear weapon, uh, the Red Scare becomes the dominant political issue in the nation. Um, you know, Simpkins begins to pay a price for her efforts to link the movement to groups like the SNYC, Southern Negro Youth Conference, and others that did have direct ties to the Communist Party. Uh, but they, they fought about this a lot. So this didn't, this didn't really help their relationship, right? Um, but it was, in, it was McRae's indictment on criminal libel charges in early 1950 that really led to the paper's collapse. The other things were important. The finances were always a problem. But that was the real key. Um, um, the surprise decision by state and county officials to pursue parole violation charges and to sentence McRae to a chain gang created severe financial uh, uh, concerns for, for McRae personally and for the newspaper. And as I said, McRae always believed that Governor James F. Burns had ordered McRae arrested in an effort to destroy the black press in South Carolina. And there is no evidence to support that. I need to emphasize that. No, I and other investigators and researchers have not found evidence to report that Burns had done that. That's just not, I don't think that's really true. But there is evidence that he was angry at the Lighthouse and Informer. You can see it in his papers. It would be, they kept, his papers include some issues of the Lighthouse and Informer. Um, so that was clue. Uh, that was true. But, Let's just say that McRae was right, that Burns or other state officials really wanted to use that criminal libel charge to destroy the black press in South Carolina. Um, then the governor's plan succeeded spectacularly because the lighthouse and informer never recovered from McRae's imprisonment. That criminal libel case was that important, I believe. Um, McRae and Simpkins could both be stubborn, as I said, and even petty at times, but it is worth noting the content, context that helped escalate their feud. As the Clarendon County school desegregation case worked its way through the courts, the white response to the black civil rights movement grew harsher. As I say, Brown radicalized the white South, white segregationist South. Prominent white newspapers joined the effort to launch a campaign of massive resistance against black rights. Cecil Williams showed his car with that 1956 tag and he said it was, a, you know, he put press on it, but he said that was a particularly dangerous year. It was. Um, the legislature held what came to be known, what was called at the time, the segregation session, in which it passed laws that essentially criminalized the NAACP in the state. Didn't entirely, but said state workers, like teachers, could not be members of the NAACP. And that's what um, he was talking about with the Orangeburg, those heroes in Orangeburg who actually resigned rather than deny that they were joining the NAACP. Um, Septima Clark was fired in Charleston from a job in, what is it, Johns Island, I believe, because she was a member of the NAACP uh, in, in Charleston. They, they Essentially, this was an assault a broad-based assault on the civil rights movement in South Carolina. And for black South Carolinians, the threat of retribution, physical, economic, psychological, think about Orangeburg, um, Cecil Williams talked about the boycott in Orangeburg. Um, parents in Orangeburg had petitioned uh, to integrate the schools after Brown in Orangeburg. Well, the white community just um, came together and basically made, fired as many uh, blacks from their jobs as they could, as they had the power to do, uh, and created, uh, you know, essentially this sort of mass unemployment in the black community. It was horrific, and Cecil Williams is right. It has not gotten enough attention in the story of the civil rights movement. The boycott and the backlash against those uh, parents in Orangeburg in 1955 and 56. Um, as I say, um, McRae paid a particularly high price personally during this 
hold the criminal indictment, obviously, the time on the chain gang. His family broke up. His wife went back to uh, Flint, Michigan, the, so his marriage fell apart. Uh, he lost his newspaper. Uh, McRae was a proud man, as I've said before, a very proud man. Uh, and he had received, he, his family had received financial aid from Simpkins and her husband during, the time, during his time in jail. And that was a benevolent act. But the generosity was nonetheless added another layer of complexity uh, to their relationship that it really could not bear. And they really split during the 50s. It played out in the newspapers, in the Lighthouse and Informer. Uh, and McRae was writing about it in the Baltimore Afri Af Afro-American. Um, McRae came back to the Lighthouse and Informer briefly after, the, after being on the chain gang, but then he left to become the chief correspondent for the Baltimore Afro-Americans Carolina edition. But that newspaper never gained the readership, the connection, the bond with the community uh, that the Lighthouse Informer had had. And the civil rights movement struggled. Since 1941, the Lighthouse and Informer had been instrumental in uniting the black community in South Carolina. The newspaper had defined American citizenship as an act of self-assertion, a right that must be earned by those willing to fight for it. Without the newspaper, the movement really lost momentum. Uh, McRae continued to work for the African American and other black newspapers across the 50s. And in 1960, his progressive Democratic Party, still actually getting stronger in some ways, launched a get out the vote effort that is credited with winning the state of South Carolina for Democratic presidential nominee John F. Kennedy that year beat Nixon narrowly in the state, and Kennedy obviously won the national election very narrowly as well. So losing South Carolina could have made a real difference. McRae, who had worked his rear end off for Kennedy, had really put together that get out the vote effort, um, had hoped to get a patronage job, patronage job from the new administration, thought it was gonna come through, but it never did. He's very disappointed by that. So, and with no other real job prospects in South Carolina, uh, McRae eventually left his home state in late 64 to take a job at his alma mater in Talladega in Alabama. Um, McRae handled public relations for the college and eventually served as a recruitment official and a top aide to the school's president. He managed to build a comfortable life, new life in Talladega, but he found it hard to leave newspaper work behind. In the 80s, he began writing a weekly column for the Charleston Chronicle, if you know that paper, for, uh, his column, The Way It Was, is worth reading. Uh, it ran for more than five years, and it served as what I would call an invaluable source of public memory, recalling a black political and social movement that had often been marginalized, especially at that point, marginalized in the Palmetto State's history. And we heard others talk about that today, uh, Cecil Williams, uh, James Felder, and others talk about how the effort in South Carolina, especially that effort in the 40s and 50s, uh, has not received the attention it's deserved in the context of the larger civil rights uh, struggle. Um, he, in the Chronicle, he frequently wrote about the lighthouse and his former, and he clearly saw himself as, uh, the, and himself as part of a historically important institution. In one editorial, talking about the black press, that's what he thought was a historically important institution and why the Black Press Institute here is so important. In one editorial, he honored the nation's first black newspaper, Freedom's Journal, calling it the father and founder of the black press and, other, and urging other newspapers to carry on its legacy. And he said the black newspaper must remain vigilant in battling racism and injustice. Around the, around the same time, McRae's newspaper published a political cartoon, big political cartoon, on page four, showing newspapers labeled Negro Press rolling off a printing press and flowing across the sky to form a planet identified as a new world. Um, he clearly saw himself in the historical context of the black press as a political institution that was important to the aspirations of the black community in American democracy. Um, but, and I'll end with this, uh, McRae uh, was also a realist. 
about what it took to work in the black press, particularly in the South during the Jim Crow era. He more than anyone understood the sacrifices required of a black newspaper man in, at that time. As he put it, only a quote, plum stomp down fool would try to publish a black newspaper during the Jim Crow era. But McCray managed to do it for 14 years and he helped change South Carolina forever. His induction into the South Carolina Press Association is frankly long overdue. And thank you very much for, for putting up with me. I appreciate it. Did we want to do questions? If I hope we have some. Hello? Hey, there we go. Uh, yeah, so uh, we open up the floor for any questions right now that you might have for Mr. Bedingfield. Does anyone have any questions? Love to hear from the students. Anything you thinking about? We got a, oh, we got a question back here. Um. Based, I wanted to ask, based on his um, newspaper editorials, what would you say was the most monumental or like the biggest thing that he achieved with an editorial or, or something like that, mm -hmm. like with his writing yeah. specifically? I think if I had to look for long-term impact, I would go back to the early days of the paper. Um, Right after its launch, the uh, uh, Simpkins and others, the NAACP, Reverend James Hinton was involved, others were involved, were working very closely with the NAACP to launch a voting rights campaign. To, and it was very tricky. You had to get uh, blacks to try to register and be denied, and then sign an affidavit saying they had been denied the right to register to vote uh, in the Democratic Party primary. And to, do, to vote in the primary, you had to register to join the party. And the Democratic Party um, was a mess then. Uh, it, it's the strangest political party. There's a new book out about the Democratic Party in general. And you, you should read it. It's such a strange party because um, at that point in its history, it, it was a, this alliance that included uh, northern uh, progressive labor uh, movement and immigrants uh, and uh, Roosevelt's New Deal coalition and the most recalcitrant backward looking segregationists from the south that was the political coalition that made up the democratic party and the democratic party had been it has an awful history of it was the party that supported slavery it was the party that overthrew reconstruction in the south uh, it is has a there's a side of the democratic party uh, that is just plain awful uh, and then, but then there's this side that emerges around uh, immigrant communities, labor communities, working class people in the more industrial north that moves in a progressive direction. And so it was not a certainty. Uh, in fact, you might even say it was counterintuitive for the uh, African Americans, blacks in South Carolina in 1939, 1940 to want to break into the party of Strom Thurmond uh, and worse, of Cotton Ed, uh, uh, Cotton Ed Smith, the senator, these, these avowed racist and white supremacists. Why would you want to be in that party? Why wouldn't you be in the Republican Party, which at least has a history of supporting civil rights, even though that history had faded pretty badly by then? McRae and others thought, no, if we can join, the, if black voters join the Democratic Party, we can team up with this progressive coalition in the North uh, and, and be a majority party in the country and actually make progress. But it wasn't an obvious choice at the time. And so you had to, A, at that time, you had to convince black voters that they should go try to join the Democratic Party, which to many of them seemed outrageous. You had to convince them to risk uh, the kind of blowback or potential violence or economic retribution that would come from trying to join the party. Um, and so in doing that, in the first two, three years, you just see 
some of, some of his sarcastic editorials, but a lot of just informational editorials about this is how you register, this is why you should register, this is what Thurgood Marshall and other NAACP lawyers are doing to help you register, and this is how you fill out the affidavit. And it, I think that, that three years when they really put together that campaign uh, was really the building of the movement there. And so some of it was not the kind of stuff that you and I both liked about McRae's style of writing. Some of it was just very straightforward and informative stuff. And it clearly reflected McRae working with uh, NAACP leaders to craft these editorials that tried to urge, um, urge uh, black citizens across the state. As I said, most lived in rural areas to try to register and they knew what that meant. Register to vote, that could be a death sentence. You're asking me to go try to get in the Democratic Party? I could be killed for that, and no one does anything about it. Seen it happen before, you know? And so I think that was probably the most impactful era for the paper. It was great, too. I mean, I'm tempted to say it was in supporting the Clarendon County case uh, over school uh, integration, when Burns was trying to do everything he could to persuade um, the um, black citizens, the NAACP in the state, to withdraw from the um, Briggs v. Elliott, right? Uh, I mean, that he really did fight hard uh, on that. And those were some really dramatic, classic John McRae editorials. But I really would point to that earlier area as probably the most important in having an impact. Uh, I think we have another question back here. Hi again. Um, I just wanted to ask about how long did it take you to gather your research on John Henry McRae and complete your book, Newspaper Wars? Um, it, it, you know, probably longer than it should have. Um, and also complete, as I started my presentation with, I wish I hadn't have completed it because there are more people I wanted to talk to. I realize there's more to know and more nuance to include in it. But to answer your question seriously, as a, long, as a journalist for a long time, so when I came back to graduate school, I was as much of an adult as I was ever going to be. I was a fully formed adult, actually kind of an old adult. So I was in a hurry. Um, and I knew when I came across the John McRae papers, first I was stunned. I couldn't believe that, you know, he had kept another, again, I don't, I'm going to answer your question, but you can see how he viewed himself and the black press as something important, as a historical figure, he kept all his papers. I mean, who does that? You know, and I, as a his, something of a historian now, rather than a journalist, I, I care a lot about whether people kept their papers or a lot. McRae was a black journalist in South Carolina in the 40s who had the, the sort of sense of history to keep all his papers. And you go in that Carolinianana library and there they all are. They're not everything, and there's not every edition of the Lighthouse and Informer, sadly, but it's all there. So when I saw that, I said, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but it's going to be something that has to do with uh, McRae. Uh, and so that I, I, all in, it would be from 2010 to when I actually published the book in 2017, but the research really ended about 2015, 2016. If that's, you know, it took a while. But, you know, I will say this. I wrote the book, I wrote some papers, and I was really pleased to see one of the students had cited an actual journal article. So I wrote some journal articles about this, academic journals, a few articles about this, which helped me figure out some things and work through some issues before I really sat down to say, okay, I'm gonna write the book. And as you know, the book, uh, you may know, the book also deals with the um, massive resistance and the white press's role in massive, Massive resistance. That's where the term newspaper wars comes from. McRae and his newspaper were fighting for, for black rights. Um, Thomas R. Waring, William Workman, and others were using their news, newspapers just as much in just a political and uh, advocacy way, as a means of advocacy, to fight against uh, black civil rights. And that's the story I was trying to tell. Hello again. Hey. Uh, Mika Gazin here. Um, hey, Mika. Yes. Um, I'm a big fan of your work, as you already heard from me. I'm based in Charleston, and I wanted to ask you a question 
Um, one of your pieces that you wrote that, that's not included in the book, um, the comparison between the paper that's currently in Charleston, the Post and Courier, oh. or News and Courier, and comparing that to Breitbart, I had a question, given the state of current, the current state of legacy media and the, mm -hmm. the, the tectonic shifts there, we're, I feel like that piece you wrote uh -huh. in those comparisons, parallel to the time we're in currently, where there's a prohibition on teaching black history in schools, I wanted to ask you, are you encouraged by this moment? Because I know some moments like this can actually be a moment of, um, can present some opportunities to disrupt the media landscape. I want to know if you had any thoughts about that. I, I think this, the, the uh, new book that I'm a part of, it's a collection that I co-edited with a colleague uh, who also used to be at the University of South Carolina as well, deals with some of what you're talking about, Tamika. It, it, it really does. I, I guess I'd start by saying, uh, when you, when it, you the, the connection between Breitbart, particularly the Breitbart of the 2016-2017 era, um, and the news and courier of Thomas R. Waring in the uh, 50s and during massive resistance, um, both of them were um, uh, media outlets that were pursuing political goals. I mean, you might give Breitbart a little credit, you know, in the sense that they, they were very upfront about it. And both of them, and I will say this, I'm, you know, you, you dig in somebody's papers, you read their stuff, you read personal stuff, and you, you, you grow a little more sympathetic about certain characters. And I'm not entirely unsympathetic about Thomas R. Waring. I mean, I kind of see where he was coming from, although it was odious. But, but both Breitbart and the News and Courier of that era of that era, um, were operating in bad faith. In other words, they are pursuing uh, news stories and providing information not to inform the public and searching for uh, as close a version, can't get to a final version, but as close a version to the truth as you can. They were using information in every way possible to pursue a political goal. Right, and meaning they would, would twist and turn and cherry pick evidence, and they would do everything possible to deliver an argument. It just so happened that McRae's argument, he was up front about it, and he was also um, on, in the right. I'm sorry, but I mean, he was pursuing a, a, a freer and fair American democracy. He was trying to fulfill the promise of the Constitution. Uh, which has never been fully fulfilled, but as Frederick Douglass said later in his life, it was the hope, it was the road to reform if you could actually fulfill its promise. And that's what McRae was doing. What Waring was doing and what, frankly, Breitbart was doing uh, was uh, mischievous, mischievous disinformation. It was propaganda meant to stir up anger and hatred at political opponents uh, and... And so, yeah, I, I, that, that's the connection between Breitbart and the News and Courier and its political efforts. Um, do I see hope? I always see hope. I mean, I, I do. I, you know, we talk about, I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that I'm, you know, I see a lot of negative stuff with our media environment right now. I see it is easier than ever to spread disinformation. Uh, it just is, and we know that. And, there, and we see uh, forces... Um, uh, people of bad faith who have learned how to use uh, social media and digital technology to inundate the public with waves and waves of information to sow um, uh, confusion and to make people basically just sort of give up on getting to the bottom of the facts and getting at the reality of uh, certain moments and also appealing to, uh, you know, um, appealing to their better angels uh, to pursue better policies, right? Policies that should uplift us. Um, it is just too easy in this environment to confuse people, so doubt, make them question themselves, make them question others they thought they agreed with, to divide movements of social, for social justice, to make sure there's division within the movement. It's just hard to do. Now, on the bright side, there is, there, you know, we can all speak to a large audience. If we can reach that audience, we can all 
um, actually counter some of that. So I always see hope. Uh, but I could probably, if you really wanted to um, spend some time with me today, I would probably talk more about the problems I see with our media environment than the hope right now. The decline of local newspapers committed to finding the best available version of the truth is a devastating attack on our democracy. I see it, and we see it. It opens up uh, the uh, floor for all of these actors of bad faith to just inundate us with bad information. Um, I'd love to say that I have more hope, but I am a little worried about um, our media environment right now. But please keep working. Keep doing the work you're doing. All right. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I just really have to, again, congratulate Kevin, um, uh, Janie, right? And the others here on this South Carolina Black Press Institute. It is such a great thing you've done here.